All right, scholars, welcome back. I hope you all are well. Um, today we're going to cover uh, chapter 10. We're going to split this uh, chapter, uh, Human Development Across a Lifespan, into two uh, parts. Now, the first part will be concerned with um, the development of uh, young people into adolescence. And then the second part will be um, adolescence through uh, middle adulthood and then uh, late adulthood. And so we'll talk about those uh, two parts. Um, there's a lot of research that has been done on childhood development and uh, and much more is continuing to be done on, you know, how children develop in the different stages of life uh, through, you know, infancy, through uh, even before infancy and, uh, and prenatal development as well, and how those stages are extremely important for uh, the ultimate development of the child uh, through um, you know, adolescence and then into adulthood and how each stage is pivotal um, for, uh, uh, you know, the optimal and effective out life outcomes for children uh, as they as they age. So we'll talk about that in a lot of a lot of detail. Uh, a lot of different terminology will be used. Uh, so be mindful of that as you begin to study um, for the, the exam, um, because, again, it's going to be a lot of terminology, uh, learning about a lot of the different theories and stages of development. Um, so again, be mindful of that as we as we move forward. Okay. Um, so here's just a, uh, a question just to ponder, uh, you know, as we talk about development, and human growth and development. Um, tablets have been, cell phones, and other electronic devices have been extremely uh, pivotal in um, our development as of late. Um, when I was a young child, you know, we didn't have cell phones or tablets, uh, any other electronic device, you know, most, most of what we had was, you know, just a television. And, uh, and so how do you think um, cell phones, tablets, other, other devices, uh, do they harm? Um, are they harmful to child development? Um, you know, about 96% of Americans have a TV, which is, you know, that's not the biggest issue. Um, but three, uh, about 94%, of children ages three to 18 have internet access either through a computer uh, or a smartphone with 50% of those children having a smartphone by the turn, by the, at the time they turn 11, which is and can be uh, detrimental if that is what has been raising the children. Um, so when we think about uh, the exposure and the, uh, the environment and the stimulation of a particular environment, mental stimulation, um, are we allowing our children to uh, be raised by their devices and pacify them um, through the use of their devices. So, you know, do we just let them sit off in a corner and and explore the internet and YouTube and um, social media, or do we create opportunities for uh, social interaction in a better way um, that allows them to develop uh, a lot faster um, or a lot more effectively? Uh, because again, when you introduce some of the technology, it does speed up the uh, progression of development. And so we have to be mindful of that as we uh, we think about tablet use, um, cell phone use, and, and other devices that might uh, hinder or um, speed up development before we, we're ready for them to uh, experience certain things. All right. So again, when we talk about the impact, um, here are a few of the positives. Here are a few of the negatives. Uh, one of a couple of the negative impacts uh, social skills are sometimes stunted if they're not interacting with uh, the children their age. And if you don't allow them to, um, you know, interact with their peers, uh, certain relationships can be stunted, uh, especially parental relationships. If the parents aren't really engaging with their children and, and just pushing them off on, on the devices. Um, the health problems, obviously, when um, children are uh, more active, um, are going outside or getting enough fresh air. Uh, that's when we start to see, we talked about um, the, the, the growth in obesity in young children, 17% um, are considered obese. Uh, and then the ability to focus. You know, we live in a, in a generation now where uh, everything is so quick. You know, you can look things up on the internet, uh, you know, Snapchat, and TikTok, and all these other devices, all these other social media sites are really, really quick. They show you these really short clips and then... Uh, you move on to the next one. And so the ability to focus uh, is sometimes hindered and hampered because of that. And so we just have to be mindful of that and how, um, 
the negative effects are influencing the young people. And then obviously the dangers of browsing, you know, children uh, without any parental controls, um, without any parental monitoring can view things that are uh, not age appropriate. And, uh, you know, the things that we watch, the things that we consume visually um, can definitely impact us uh, psychologically in a, in, a, in a negative way. So we just want to be mindful of all those different negative impacts. But there are also um, positive impacts as well. You know, self-expression, being able to express yourself. You know, many of our young people make videos and, and have uh, opportunities to express themselves with their peers. And, you know, that's a great thing, right? Um, doing research, being able to look things up online. Um, you know, there's a, a wealth of knowledge and information on the internet, and it gives individuals an opportunity to explore so many different things, so many different careers, and uh, so many different topics and concepts. So uh, there are some great opportunities for impact, positive impact uh, for children who use um, different devices, especially uh, when we talk about the critical thinking skills and being able to bond with individuals that are not uh, in close proximity, you know, interacting with individuals from their families who they may not be able to see, um, you know, as often, you know, maybe they live across the country. Uh, so you do have an opportunity to bond uh, and form a community with other people who may have similar interests. Uh, you know, the gaming community, um, LGBTQ rights and issues, uh, you have community online that can uh, really serve as a, a way to have that sense of belonging and affiliation that people uh, long for um, as they as they mature and as they grow up. Okay, here are the objectives. Um, very many of them, got about four pages of them. Um, but again, we'll talk about um, the first part. We'll talk about the uh, the beginning, the very very beginning, and then we'll we'll work our way up through, um, you know, late childhood, right in right into adolescence, and then from adolescence we'll move on to part two. Um, up through adulthood and talk about the different changes in uh, morality and um, personality development uh, and uh, just our view on, uh, on certain things as we age and, and mature uh, as adults. Okay, here are some of the other objectives. Um, but again, these, these slides will be posted. And any of the videos that you see, I won't play um, here, uh, but I will post those videos in the, and list them in the description uh, with the title of the slide. And then I'll have the link to the videos if you want to, to look at the videos after, after you see them posted on the slides here. All right, so unit 10.1, let's start uh, talking about the progress before birth. So um, development starts even before you are born and uh, each of the stages in your mother's womb at, at the beginning of conception, there are some really pivotal points in prenatal development that are really essential for uh, your development um, as, a, as a young child. And uh, so we'll talk about different uh, environmental factors. We'll talk about the, uh, the, the environment on the outside that may affect you um, as, you're, as you're conceived and then your mother's womb developing. So we'll talk about those different pieces um, as, we, as we move forward. Okay. All right, so when we talk about the course of prenatal development, there are three um, distinct phases. And, you know, there is a continuous development over the course of uh, your time in your mother's womb. But we'll talk about these three, uh, the germinal stage, the embryonic stage, and the fetal stage. We'll also, at the end of this, we'll talk about the different trimesters, the first, second, and third trimester. And we'll talk about how these three stages or phases are and can be broken even further down into kind of the broader phases of the trimester and the different things that uh, developmentally we see happen um, with the fetus and then the infant um, as they are, uh, or the fetus as they are kind of developing and then getting closer to the time when they're being born, okay? So when we talk about one of the first phases, the first phase is the germinal stage. And the germinal stage uh, is that at conception, this is the beginning at conception um, when you know, the sperm reaches the egg and inserts itself into the egg and the DNA from the mom and the dad. This is where um, you determine what your, your, you know, what your gender is, uh, what your sex is, rather. And, you know, some of the other most more important parts of, you know, what your hair color is going to be, what your eye color is going to be. And with this stage, this becomes the, the creation of a zygote, which is a microscopic mass. And 
the zygote then begins to multiply almost instantly. And then more, it kind of migrates along the, the mother's fallopian tube from the ovaries uh, to the uterine cavity. And the uterine cavity is where um, the zygote then inserts itself. And as it's inserting itself, it becomes a blastocyst. And the blastocyst is that collection of cells. But we start off as a zygote. And one thing I like to, to, to say is, especially during this time, as a zygote, everything that you're going to be, everything that, you know, you've been created to do and your purpose in life, that is the very beginning, the zygote. All of your genetic material is there, right? Um, your, who you're going to be, your personality is that, that beginning of your, who your personality is going to be and what you're going to look like, again, is formed right there. And really, really important piece um, you know, the body is extremely complex, really dynamic organism. And to know that at that one cell, and then you begin to, again, rapidly divide into various cells, um, that's just a very, very special time, right? Um, so the mitosis is that process where, you know, you start off as, again, that one single cell, and then you, uh, fewer and fewer, about one half of the zygote survive in the first two weeks. But again, as that mitosis process, the division of those cells happens, again, very, very, very um, fragile point, right? We have to be mindful of, you know, what we're doing. A lot of young people don't even know, or a lot of, you know, mothers don't even know that they're pregnant at that point. Um, because again, it's very, very small cells being divided and divided over time. Um, during this time, you have, uh, especially for twins, fraternal and identical, uh, the zygote, is either a monozygotic or a dizygotic cell, right? The monozygotic cell is a cell that when it reaches the fallopian tube, it's one egg, right? And then it splits off into two, um, two, two distinct cells. And those two distinct eggs, I mean, those, those two distinct cells then split off and the genetic material is exactly the same, right? And so they then they begin to develop as their own um embryos, right? So then you, you go from the blastocyst and then you split into those two individual cells or those two embryos. And then that is what, that's when you have the identical twins. The dizygotic is when you have two zygotes traveling down to the tube, they're inserting themselves into two eggs. They have uh, about half of their genetic material is the same. And then you begin to have those two separate embryos. And again, they might be uh, look very, very differently than the identical twins. The zygote, again, as it travels down um, the fallopian tube, uh, then it implants itself into the uterine wall about the seventh day. Um, at the seventh day, then that's when you begin to see the placenta beginning to form. The placenta is that the sac that provides oxygen or the nutrients to the, to the fetus, uh, and it expels any uh, excrements from the fetus um, out through the mom. But it's estimated that about only 60% of natural conceptions fail to implant into the uterus, uterine wall. And so, again, we have to be mindful of that, right? Um, and if it does not implant, then the mother will never know that they were pregnant. But again, almost half um, those uh, zygotes that are traveling down the uterus fallopian tube do not uh, implant themselves. And so that's a very, very special time and uh, very, very important process uh, when we talk about the development of a fetus. Okay. The embryonic stage uh, begins once the zygote is implanted uh, in the uterine wall, uh, week two until the end of about the second month, then you have what we call the embryo. And at 22 days after conception, um, there is what we call a neural tube that forms and the, uh, the, the back of the, the embryo developing the spinal cord, the brain everything begins to start forming. Again, it starts from the brain, the spinal cord, and everything then begins to form out from the inside out, right? Your most vital organs begin to form. Uh, the bodily system begins to form. Um, you see some, you see here some distinguishable hands, feet. Uh, let me get my highlighter out, uh, my laser pointer. You see the fingers, you see the toes, you begin to see the eyes begin to form. Uh, everything began, began, becomes more discernible as the embryo begins to develop. Uh, the heartbeat begins around the six and a half to seven week mark uh, after conception. But once that happens, you know, you are again beginning to grow rapidly. Uh, 
multicellular organism again in the embryo, and you're developing over and over very, very quickly. Um, and this is probably the most um, vulnerable point um, in the development for a, an embryo, because again, all of the vital organs and the systems that form our function, again, that is when we're very vulnerable to the toxins of the environment, drug use or alcohol use, uh, stress, uh, any nutrients or nutrition that our mother is taking in is helping to form us. Uh, this is where we see a lot of the birth defects during the embryonic stage. If there are any issues in the in the you know the placenta and the fallopian, you know, as the embryo is developing, we start to see those birth defects during this time. Uh, so it's important, very, very, very vulnerable time um, for the embryo. So when the mom knows that they're pregnant, it's important that they're doing the right things, taking care of their body. Um, and consuming the right things, so their their fetus, um, their embryo is going to be developing at the right time, um, in the right way, uh, optimally and effectively. Okay. After the embryonic stage, then you hit the you your last stage, the fetal stage, and you start off again the formation, right? The ovaries and the testes, uh, you can smile and frown, the circulatory system by around twelve weeks, right? And it progresses very very quickly, right? Very very quickly over the course of time. Um, rapid growth uh, and muscles and bones begin to form in the first few months. Organs continue to grow and begin to function as we begin to grow. Um, and again, all your sex organs begin to differentiate. So we'll talk about the trimester, but during this time, you can go get your um, ultrasound and then they're able to look at the sex around, around the 14th week, uh, able to differentiate, you know, what sex the baby is going to be. Um, brain cells multiply. Um, uh, the layers of fat is deposited under the skin for insulation. Uh, your respiratory, your digestive system begins to mature. And after a certain point, you know, 32 weeks, uh, 36 weeks, you begin to see the, the baby can um, function pretty much on their own uh, without the mom. You know, they can be born, you know, uh, pretty, pretty easily around 28 weeks. You know, the survivor rate is, I got a little less as you move, you know, further down. Um, closer to uh, the beginning of conception, but as you move closer uh, to, uh, you know, full term, um, that's when the, the odds of survival definitely increase uh, as you move, move closer to full term. All right. So, you know, uh, we talk about the uh, germinal stage, again, the, the conception, we talk about the embryonic stage, and then we talk about the fetal stage. Uh, we'll also talk about you know, the stages of pregnancy in trimester uh, distinction. Um, first, second, third trimester. This is how it's communicated um, in the doctor's office. Um, you know, in each trimester, the fetus um, will meet specific developmental milestones, and we talk about them um, with the embryonic, germ I mean, the germinal, embryonic, and the fetal stage. But when you talk about the first trimester, zero to 13 weeks, uh, we saw that you can determine and distinguish sex. Uh, of the fetus based on um, from, you know, nine to 12 weeks. Um, so the fetus's body structure and the organs develop. And so you can take and see again, even this, the second trimester, you can begin to see the gender of the baby can be determined at this time. So you, you can feel their baby's first movements. Uh, and this is what we know is can be known as quickening, right? But again, each trimester you begin to see and the mother's experience very, very different. Um, um, experiences as far as what their body is going through. Uh, the first trimester is probably the worst for moms. You know, the, the uh, morning sickness and, you know, being very tired and a lot of things are happening on the inside of them. And so their body is having to adjust and use a lot of their energy. And so they might be a little sleepy. Uh, during the second trimester, that's when things kind of, they call it kind of the honeymoon period where, you know, the, the mother is a little more comfortable. They're getting a lot more sleep. Uh, it's not much more, it's not much pain, but they do feel, you know, as a mother, the, the child begins to um, develop their limbs and the bones and, and muscles begin to form, you know, you know, it does, they might be able to feel some back pain or, you know, lower upper back pain. Um, so there might be pain experienced in other, in other areas because of, you know, you have a, a child who's growing um, and since they're being able to move, it puts a, a little more strain on the mom. And then the third trimester, obviously, that's a, uh, an opportunity where you see um, the, the baby becoming, you know, full infant, almost almost an infant, right? 
Um, so the baby's bones are fully formed, muscles are are there, um, the touch receptors are fully developed, and the baby's organs are able uh, capable of functioning on their own. And so the baby can be born um, at that time with little to no issues at all. Um, so again, first, second, and third trimester, that's how it's communicated in the doctor's office. Um, and so, you know, if you ever wanted to know what those things were, that's it. Okay. Um, when we talk about prenatal development, we also have to discuss uh, the, the environmental factors that contribute to um, optimal health of the, of the fetus. And then obviously uh, the, the being, them being born and, uh, and how the environment plays a big role. Um, there are a lot of non uh, genetic environmental factors that can contribute to maternal morbidity and mortality through just chemical exposure in air, water, food, other consumer products like um, uh, you know, deodorant and shampoo, all those other things that leak into uh, the bloodstream through your skin. Um, and there, there are some disproportionate things that happen with racial and ethnic minorities. And, you know, disproportionately, we live in, uh, you know, poor neighborhoods and, and areas where uh, there are a lot of chemicals and non-chemical stressors that contribute to observe our health disparities that we see and the maternal morbidities and mortality that we see in uh, African-American women, um, especially uh, in today's society. Um, and so we have to be mindful of those things, right? How, uh, how are the environments affecting us? Um, are they uh, positive? Are we having enough? Uh, is there the air pollution? Is the air quality um, better? Is the water um, quality better in, in certain areas than, than in you know, racial and ethnic minorities or areas or communities? We just have to be mindful of that when we're talking about um, those environmental factors. But nutrition, stress, and drug use are all extreme environmental factors, those non-genetic environmental factors that play a big role. Uh, there are certain essential nutrients that children need um, and fetuses need as they're growing. Uh, and when they get poor nutrition through um, their mom not eating the right foods, it increases the risk of other birth complications and neurological deficits. Uh, we talked about the embryonic stage where it's really, they're very, very vulnerable um, to a lack of nutrition um, because, again, those all of those vital organs and the limbs are forming. And so it's important that they have the proper nutrition, nutrition, um, essential nutrients, vitamins and nutrients that are, are essential for growth um, are being consumed by the mom um, during that time. Stress is also um, uh, emotional reactions to different stressful events can disrupt hormones. Um, when we have too much cortisol in our system, not enough dopamine, not enough serotonin, these are good hormones that help to uh, support the development of the fetus. And so when we uh, don't have and have, in, you know, hormonal imbalances, this fosters, you know, a lack of a healthy prenatal development. And so we want to maintain a low stress level so that we can have the optimal development for uh, the fetus. Uh, drug use, obviously, again, when we talk about um, drugs, um, narcotics, even over-the-counter drugs can influence and affect uh, the, the fetus. And so it's important that before we take any uh, medication, we, we make sure that our doctors approve it um, because some medicines, even those over-the-counter drugs, can affect, uh, again, and pass through the placenta. It can cause problems for the fetuses um, and newborns. It says 21,000 babies uh, were born um, addicted to narcotics each year. And so it's important that when you know that you are with child, and mothers know that they're with child, that they don't consume um, substances that they know might influence and affect uh, the, the fetus negatively. Um, again, drugs can and and do influence fetuses in a negative way. Um, alcohol, obviously, is another thing that happens. Uh, so fetal alcohol syndrome, you know, a lot of congenital inborn problems associated with excessive alcohol use during pregnancy. So you see the differences in the development of the child's face. Right, uh, flatter face, uh, cleft lip, um, you know, undeveloped jaw bones, very, very wide opening, um, you know, the nasal bridge is a lot lower. So again, you see um, a lot of those things happening when mothers uh, are consuming alcohol uh, through some pivotal points in the prenatal stages. Um, in terms of in, in, you know, illness, environmental toxins that we talked about, um, air quality, food, 
consumption of other other substances through you know uh, deodorant and shampoo, um, and then you know other fetal origin of the disease. So uh, you know if, if a you know mom has chicken pox or develops uh, the flu, those also have an effect and can affect um, prenatal development and cause vulnerabilities decades later, uh, just based on the sickness uh, when children and uh, are experiencing their moms are experiencing illnesses as as they are developing their child. Okay. So it says which stage of prenatal development is considered to have a great deal of vulnerability because virtually all basic physiological structures are being formed. Okay. Um, again, we talked about that that very very vulnerable state, and that um, that vulnerable state would be considered the embryonic stage. And again because of those physiological structures and uh, the internal structures, the lungs and the heart and everything being developed, uh, those bodily organs are you know, being formed in that stage. It's important that uh, you see um, you know, low stress levels, better nutrition, um, all of those things have to happen um, because people, um, you know, the fetus is very vulnerable during that stage. It says most miscarriages occur um, during this period, and, and most major structural birth defects also result um, from problems that occur during the embryonic stage. So we have to be mindful uh, of the prenatal development stages and how the environmental environment or the environment um, and situations influence uh, these stages. Okay. All right. So let's talk about motor, social, and language development in childhood. You know, these are also really pivotal points um, in development of the young person. Um, when we create environments, we talk about the environment in the uh, prenatal development stages, but once the child is born, the, uh, the quality of the environment that they grow up in um, affects motor, social, and language development in a really positive or uh, could be adverse or negative way. So we have to be mindful of that as well um, when we're talking about development of young people. Okay. So motor development is just the progression of, you know, our muscular coordination. And uh, that's really required for all of the activities that we participate in. Um, walking, being able to grasp things, um, standing up, all of those things are really, really important. Um, you know, as uh, in that, when infants are initially born, they, they don't and can't move much at all because their muscle, muscles are not uh, developed yet. But as their muscles become stronger, uh, their neck muscles become stronger, their arms or legs, you begin to see um, babies doing things that, um, you know, are and happens really, really quickly. Babies are doing things like raising their head and turning their head and, you know, grasping for things very, very early. Um, and then those things become more fine tuned uh, as they mature. And so you can see uh, at, you know, zero to one month old. You know, their head's prone, they can lift their head. But, um, as they get from like three uh, or two months to about four, four and a half, you know, arm support, they can roll over, they can pull themselves up to stand, they can walk, many can walk and hold when they're holding on furniture. Uh, they stand up alone, walk along, then you can walk, walk up steps, run, and those things begin to happen um, as they reach, uh, you know, one years old and beyond. And so it's really, really fascinating how children begin life having to, to depend on their mom to carry them and, uh, and to, to grab things for them. And then over the course of time, they're able to then develop their coordination and their strength and are able to do things that uh, and don't need the help of their mom anymore. Right. So the maturation, maturation period, right, are those, you know, the blueprint for what's happening inside the child. Uh, so the development reflects any uh, unfolding of the genetic blueprint. That's the maturation period. And when we talk about the developmental norms, these are what we consider the developmental norms. Uh, you know, at each of these different stages, you know, if a baby's not doing some of these things, I'm not saying it, it you know, there's a, there's a range, right? Because everyone has uh, and and the individual differences when, they, when it comes to uh, the developmental norms. But there is a, a period. Right, that's been studied over time that, you know, someone who is walking uh, well alone from about 11 months to about uh, 
a little bit over a year, right? That's that's kind of the period. And it's not to say that they have to walk in this period, but that's kind of the average there. That's the average, that's the range. Some people may, some some infants may uh, may walk a little longer, it might take them a little longer to, to learn to walk. Some may walk them sooner, right? So there are some, it's a, it kind of a continuum and a range um, where the development of norms are uh, kind of fit within that range. Okay. Um, one of the other things that we talk about is attachment. And attachment is extremely important. Um, and it's based on the relationship that you, that you have with your caregivers. Um, attachment is that emotional bond, that affection uh, that you have between infants and their caregivers. And, you know, de depending on the relationship in the very beginning, it depends on the level of uh, social development, pro-social skills that, that are exhibited later on. Um, separation anxiety is a good indication that there may be um, a really healthy development and, and, you know, relationship built between the caregiver and the infant. Um, and so separation anxiety is just in any distress uh, where infants, you know, that when they, they're separated from their mom or their dad, they have this really big distress. They cry when they're, when they're separated from their parents. And, you know, that's a good thing because they see their parents as a home base, as safety, as a nurturing, nurturing place. And so that's a great, that's a great thing. It's a great thing to see. Um, so the theories of attachment, um, one of the, the, the biggest theories of attachment was created by or uh, talked about by uh, Harry Harlan. And the studies of attachment, he, he studied with Reese's monkeys. So what he did was he took Reese's monkeys and weaned them from their mom and separated from their mom after birth. And he, uh, he formed this wire monkey that provided the, the monkey with food. And he had a cloth monkey that just provided the monkey with comfort. And so what he was able to determine was that monkeys and children are comforted. And when they're comforted, they build close relationships. Now, the food, the sustenance, uh, the nutrients that are provided by the wire monkey, that was really, really important. But the monkey spent way more time, almost uh, 75, 80 percent of his time with the cloth monkey because of the comfort and the nurturing that they were receiving through the, the, the you know, the, the, the cloth, right? The softness of the cloth, they felt comforted, they felt the warmth. That was much more important than just food, right? So again, that attachment that we talk about is based on, you know, the warmth, the nurturing, the comfort that children experience. And that's what builds uh, the attachment style that we'll talk about next, okay? Again, I will post this video, but again, this video shows the, the development of the rhesus monkey and you have the wire monkey that provided the food right um, and then you had the cloth monkey that didn't provide any food but provided the comfort and the warmth that monkeys and not just monkeys but human beings uh desire that that sense of belonging the the safety that's what um infants and people uh, really desire okay um so mary ainsworth took um, Harlow's experiment a little bit further and was able to divide uh, the attachment styles into three separate attachment styles. You have what we call secure attachment, you have anxious and ambivalent attachment style, and then you have an avoidant attachment style. The secure attachment style is uh, the, the most common, right? The most natural, uh, the most normal development attachment style. That means that when the mother's present, the, the child can go and play and explore outside of you know the home base and they become upset uh, when the mother leaves and when the mother returns they are then pacified and then do not cry anymore right that is that's the normal normal way that the children react right uh, you know the mom leaves when you know the first first time the mom leaves the child in preschool and they do not like that right they cry they can't be comforted at the time and then when their mother returns, they are comforted, right? Over the course of time, as children begin to develop social, their social skills, you know, the, the, uh, the attachment and the distress becomes a little less severe, right? They might still feel a little sad when their mom leaves, but since they develop connections with other people in the class, their social peers and, you know, the other um, instructors and, and teachers in the classroom, um, then they're able to kind of be pacified even, even faster and the, and the distress is not as high. Um, the anxious ambivalent style is when, you know, they're kind of anxious when their mother's near, 
they protest when they leave, their mother leaves, and then they still aren't comforted when they when their mother returns. And this is important because this might lend, lend itself to the, the idea that the infant and mother relationship wasn't all that great, right? So their the mother wasn't consistent enough in, you know, trying to meet the need of the child when the top of the child was in distress and didn't provide as much comfort. Maybe they weren't consistent. Sometimes they provide comfort. Sometimes they don't. And so that creates this, this uh, really anxious, ambivalent style of connection with the parent, right? They like their parent because sometimes they're good to them and they provide the nurturing and the comfort uh, and the sustenance. And other times they're not, they're not as, uh, as responding or don't respond as well to to the child. And so that creates this, uh, this mix of emotions. And then the last one is what we call the avoid, avoidant attachment style. And this is when they seek little contact with their mothers and they're often not distressed when they leave. That means they didn't build that close relationship with their parents or their caregiver when, they're, when they were growing up. And so that is a lot to do with just building relationship and connection with the infant. And uh, that attachment um, either really secure when the a parent is there, really responding um, to the child's needs pretty consistently. Uh, this middle one here is they're inconsistent. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And this last one, you know, the parent is not at, not as responding at all and does not um, does not take as great care of their children. Um, and so their the children then do develop this attachment style where they don't uh, form really close attachment attachments with anyone um, because they. They didn't get that growing up. Okay. So it says, which pattern of attachment is typically most common and is indicated by a child playing and exploring with mother's present, being upset when she leaves, and quickly calming down when she returns? Again, the most common one we talked about is uh, the secure attachment. Okay. And again, this is just the, uh, here's a graph that shows, you know, the, again, the most common, right, secure. Uh, the avoided is the uh, second common. And then the ancient and ambivalent, depending on what country you're in, is in the Americas, is uh, is less common, right? But again, it really depends on, you know, the the, the attachment that the parents have with their infants uh, when they're growing up. All right, so we talked about motor coordination and motor development. So language development is our next topic and, and really important topic. We talked about learning. Uh, we talked about um, language acquisition um, and the language acquisition devices, uh, the different theories to language acquisition. And so, you know, what, how do we do that? How does, how does it done, um, you know, practically um, when, when, when children are, are trying to, to communicate with not only their peers, but their parents, uh, how does that form? How, how does it happen? Um, so we'll talk about that, okay? Um, so when we begin to learn to communicate, um, you know, there's, again, what we call a biological maturation. And as we begin to, to mature biologically, or, you know, we talked about our brain development, our brains also begin to develop and certain skills. And um, again, we talk about motor coordination, but even in language development, you know, our experiences that we have along with the biological maturation are extremely important. Um, and so the situations we're in, the environment that we're in, is, is the environment stimulating or not, that creates opportunities for children to develop um, cognitively and develop their language a lot faster, depending on, you know, their, their development that they go through. So typically, um, toddlers can say between three and 50 words by 18 months. Um, and our receptive vocabulary, the receptive vocabulary is those things that we know that we might not be able to uh, readily produce, right? We know a lot of words, but we can't readily say them, right? Our productive vocabulary are the things that we can say. We can remember to say them, but our receptive vocabulary are those things that we know, we've seen before, we know um, if we, we might be able to pick it out of a, 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 a list of words based on what we know, um, but producing them um, is a little harder, right? We can't remember every word, but if I read a text, I might be able to recall um, certain words just based on based on the knowledge. We all have a larger receptive vocabulary than we have a productive vocabulary, right? So we can list off a lot of different words, but I can read an entire book and know every word and definition of the word versus me being able to spit off, 
a list of words. Um, again, and that's the receptive versus productive. Early, early word learning, um, there are th three um, different concepts that we learn um, we talk about the early word learning. We have fast mapping, uh, we have overextension errors, and we have underextension errors. And this kind of explains um, the processes that we go through cognitively and how we think through and work through um, the development of language. And a lot of what we are able to do is based on not just, uh, again, the biological maturation, but it also has a lot to do with our personal experiences and the environments that we grow in. Um, so our vocabularies will be a lot larger and our learning of words will be a lot faster if, um, if we can have an environment where children are being immersed in vocabulary and talking um, with parents, with peers, uh, and other individuals around there. So fast mapping is when children begin to make initial fast map between a new word they hear and it's likely meaning. Right. So, you know, they can learn what a ball is and see the ball and then map it to other round objects. Right. Uh, that look like balls um, uh, or basketballs or footballs. Right. And then you have uh, maybe they know what a cat is. Right. So they can map it really, really fast. Uh, and, you know, it, it happens pretty, pretty instantly. Right. Uh, they guess and then they modify and guess more input that comes in. Right. So. You know, they look at a bear and, you know, they look at two different types of bears. They know one that kind of fits their um, the description of what a bear looks like. And then if it doesn't, if something that kind of looks a little off, they may not be able to to, uh, to even fast map that. But they can make kind of distinction between, you know, certain instances, right, uh, because they see it in their environment, again, based on their experience. Uh, so they might know what, what a basketball is, bear, kitty. But they may not go to platypuses just based on their experience. They might not have a platypus near them, right? Or they might know what a platypus is based on um, their experiences. And maybe they, they read a book um, with different types of animals. And so that's why we have those types of books where it's exposing them to different words, different images and pictures. Uh, we talked about how we learn the elaboration piece. You have a word, you have a picture, and they're able to remember it based on the word and the picture, and that gives us a better opportunity to learn faster and improves our memory uh, of certain vocabulary words. Okay, um, the underextension. Um, this is an error that happens when children figure out what a word is, and then they kind of underextend based on a, a limited amount of stimulus that they've seen. Right. So maybe they've only seen a Siamese and a Persian cat. Right. And since they've only seen these types of cats. The words that they use for cats are only uh, associated with these two uh, breeds of cat, right? But then they see another cat that doesn't look like it. He's a black cat, and that doesn't—that's not a cat, right? So they can't—they um, can't identify this as a cat because they're only—they're getting—they're underextending their word and vocabulary to what they know, right? So that's the underextension. The other error is overextension, right? And this is once children figure out the words. They make a reference. And so now they overextend it to a wider range, right? So all fuzzy creatures are cats now, right? So you got a cat right here, a guinea pig, a bunny, and a dog, right? And then anything that does not have fur, it's not a cat. And this happens really common, right? Where all fuzzy creatures then become cats or become, become dogs. And then they have to make the distinction eventually to identify and distinguish between different animals. And that's a come. Again, it comes with... Um, the experience, the exposure to things in their environment, right? Reading books and letting them see different pictures of different animals allows them a little, a little better um, to be able to distinguish between different animals um, based on um, the things that they experience. Okay. Uh, some other things that happen is we combine our words, or we're beginning to combine words, we're beginning to form sentences, right? This is kind of the uh, kind of occurs at the end of the second year. They, they, they're they learning new words, um, but it's kind of de it's devoid of any preposition. So they're not forming like complete sentences, but they, you know, it's like, please give me the ball, right? Instead of saying, please give me the ball, now they say, give ball, right? So they're telegraphing it, 
right? So a child, the earlier sentences, they have the main content, words, but they don't have articles, propositions, and any other, other all the other less critical words are omitted, right? It's straight to the point. No, no other words except for eat cookie or, you know, they, they use really simplistic sentences. The other thing that happens um, during this time is over-regularization. And so this occurs when a child incorrectly generalizes grammatical rules to irregular cases where they do not apply. And so this happens when, you know, you've ever had your, your, your younger sister or your, your, young, your child say, I hit it the ball or that hurt it. You know, those are, again, past tense and they are um, over-regularization over or over-regularizing um, the grammatical rules that are associated with different past tense, present tense. Uh, and eventually, after correction, we talk about uh, operant conditioning. So after reinforcing them, um, correcting them, they then eventually begin to learn those rules. Um, we talked about um, uh, language acquisition devices, uh, the, the natural picking up of past tense, present tense, and different grammatical rules, that language acquisition device that we talked about um, being present. Noam Chomsky talked about that LAD device, but our brains are able to pick that up based on our environment. If, we're, if we grow up in an environment where, you know, uh, our peers and our family don't know the grammatical rules, then we won't know those rules. Um, naturally, it's based on um, the environment we're in and the stimulation that we get from. Okay. Um, personality. Cognitive and moral development. We'll, we'll probably end on this and then we'll move into um, adolescence um, in part two. Okay, So cognitive development is extremely important, right? So we talked about language development. You can't have language development without cognitive development, right? So cognitive development is that pattern of thinking, uh, which includes reasoning, remembering, and, and problem solving. And uh, we talked about learning, right? How do we learn? Uh, it's based on our experiences, what we experience. And it, the stages that we see, Piaget had four different theories. He had the sensory motor stage, the pre-operational stage, concrete operational mastery stage, and then the formal operational stage. And these stages are not rigid. They're not really rigid. They are really, really fluid. And as we'll see, um, these stages have been studied and they're not invariable, right? The, you know, we do kind of move through these stages, um, but they aren't all just, you reach, you know, at the end of two, then you're done with sensory motor stage, right? And then when you hit two, you get pre-operational, and at seven, then you go from, it's more of a more fluid um, kind of transition, and some of the skills that you would learn in sensory motor stage kind of overlap with what you get in pre-operational stage, so on and so forth, Okay. When we talk about the sensory motor stage, the Piaget's theory, um, Jane Piaget, he's a Swiss, uh, Swiss scientist, begins about birth to two years. We understand our world, the sensory motor. So all of our senses, we're touching things, we're picking things up, uh, we're, we're seeing things with our eyes. Uh, and we put a lot of things in, uh, in our mouth. We touch them, we chew on them, we shake them, we manipulate them in certain ways to see how things work. Right. Uh, and again, at birth, we're limited in our ability to think about images, and languages and other kinds of symbols. And, you know, it's really hard to be to have kind of a symbolic thought. Right. We can't see things if they're not in our visual system. Then we can't see them. Right. Um, but then after a period of time, um, when we talk about the pre-operational stage and the concrete operational stage. We're able to then look at abstract thought and see some symbols. Um, as, as a different way of thinking. Uh, one of the, uh, the deficits in the, the sensory motor stage is the lack of object permanence. And so this is when you've ever seen a, a, a mother playing peekaboo with her ch children, right? Young person, you cover your face and then you surprise them. That is object permanence. When they can't see the object, right? They're unable to understand that people and objects exist even when they are out of sight, right? So if I, showed a, a person a ball, you know, infant a ball, and then put the ball underneath a, a blanket, they would no longer look for the ball because of uh, they don't see it anymore, right? It's out of sight, out of mind. And so that's one of the deficits with the sensory motor stage, okay? Again, this video shows um, the sensory motor stage and how the 
explains how that happens and how it works. Uh, and again, I will post these um, at the end of the description uh, of the video. Okay. Um, the pre-operational stage is that second stage, and it extends from roughly ages of two to seven. And here are some things that um, two to seven-year-olds struggle with. Um, conservation is one of them. You know, the awareness that physical quantities uh, remain constant. Um, and so here is one of the conservation pieces, right? Um, so here's a number of collection of elements, right? Here, they're the same number here, right? And all they did was change the spacing of those dots. So uh, someone around two or three years old would say that this has more dots and this has more dots just based on the length of them, right? Uh, centration is another thing. They're, you're unable to kind of focus on just one feature, right? You're just focusing on just one thing. You can't focus on more than one. Um, so there's a, a study that was done. Um, so you're unable to see that this liquid and this liquid are the same, right? They might be uh, in a different dish, but there's the same amount of liquid in this container versus this container. And so um, there's a study that they did where they had two equally sized beakers of, of water. Um, they filled them to the same height. They assured and were able to confirm with the, the child that those were, were the same liquid. Then they poured one of the liquids into a more a thinner and a taller beaker. And then they asked them, does this beaker have more liquid in it or does the taller one have more liquid in it? And since they were unable to look at, you know, I just poured this, the two, they had the same liquid in them. I was able to, they were unable to look at the, the taller beaker and the shorter beaker and just see that, you know, it was just a different height and different uh, thin beaker, but they had the same liquid in them. So they were unable to kind of focus on two problems at one time. Irreversibility is just your inability to envision reversing uh, an action, right? So if I tore the paper in half, right, then it's like uh, they are, I can sew it back together. I could, I could take it back together, right? Are they a part of the same piece of paper, right? They would be like, no, they're not, right? But they actually are. So you can't, you know, reverse uh, an action that happened. Egocentrism is another thing where, uh, you know, they have a limited ability to share another person's point of view. So if you ask the child who had a sibling, so maybe she had another sister, it's only two sisters, right? If you ask a, a child if her sister has a sister, right, they would be like, no, right? Because they're only able to see their own point of view. They have a sister, but they can't put their themselves in their sister's point of view because their sister also has a sister, which is themselves, right? Um, so they're unable to see that um, because they're, you know, more egocentric uh, in a way. Um, one of the other uh, connections to egocentrism is the belief that all things, including inanimate objects, uh, are living and have feelings and intentions. Uh, so, you know, if the wind is blowing really, really hard, they'd be like, you know, why is the wind so mad? Right? Because they think the wind has and is living. Or, you know, when does the ocean rest? Why is it always flowing in and flowing out? Right. And so that's they, again, are giving life to uh, inanimate objects uh, in their environment. OK. And again, here's a video um, that shows uh, the conservation issue um, when we talk about pre-operational stage. The concrete operational stage, concrete meaning you're able to see tangible and, and make sure that, you know, things that things that are tangible, they can see things, they can manipulate things a lot better. Right. This extends roughly from age seven uh, to 11. Um, so they may not have, you know, full mastery of conservation, weight and volume, but they can begin to think in a logical manner. They can have overcome egocentrism. They can put themselves in someone else's shoes and see someone else's perspective. Um, and they learn the concept of reversibility, right? So they can kind of conceptualize things in their head and they can hold on to one more, more than one thing in their head at one time. And that's when they began, again, that cognition becomes really, really important. And they're able to solve issues and problems in a, in a, in a more dynamic way. So here's an example. They have, you have seven carnations, you have three daisies, okay? You, uh, you, you give uh, the, the, the child, you know, you let them know what a carnation is, you show the child what a daisy is, and then you tell the child to separate 
the carnations from the daisies. So again, you have seven carnations, you have three daisies, and then you ask the child, you know, are there more carnations or are there more daisies? And the child is able to say, yeah, there are more carnations than there are daisies, right? And then you ask them, are there more, then you, then you ask them, are there more flowers than there are daisies? And then they would say, no, there are not more flowers than there are daisies. That would be somebody who was in the pre-operational stage. But somebody who's in the concrete operational stage would be able to say, yeah, there are, there are more flowers than there are more daisies because there are 10 flowers and there are only three individual daisies, right? So the concrete operational stage, I'm able to store things and hold on to more things in one idea than in, in my mind at one time. And so that's really important when we talk about solving problems. Uh, and that's when you see, um, you know, the, the, the math, the other development of math and um, science and English, you see the development and you see the progression um, as the, uh, the difficulty of the problems become a little harder. Um, so people are able to solve, you know, the more simple problems as, you know, when, when they're older, but, you know, when they're younger, it's a little difficult. Right, because they're having to work through uh, those cognitive pieces uh, and stages of development. Okay, again, video showing um, some of those really key uh, ideas when we talk about the concrete operational stage. Okay. All right, so the last stage of development that we talk about is uh, the formal operational stage, and this goes from you know, the age of 11, roughly 11, 11 years old through the adulthood period. And this is where, you know, abstract, formal, and logical thought are, uh, they're developed, you know, they're developing and you're able to hold on to more than, more than one thing at one time and, you're, and ideas in your head at one time. Um, and you're able to solve problems um, by again, holding, you're able to see things uh, mentally and hold on to things mentally in your brain. Um, you know, Piaget, Jean Piaget did this test uh, that, you know, he uses pendulum problem that he divide, devised in 1958. And so here's the, uh, the apparatus here. And he asked participants to determine how fast the pendulum swings with the different um, lengths of string and the different weights. And what he was able to determine was that young people were able to look at the different weights, look at the different strings and see which one would be uh, would move faster, right? So, you know, they could look at it in their head and then kind of make decisions, right? So I would think that, you know, this longer string might swing a lot faster with this this heavier one here, but this longer string would be a real slow pendulum with the speed of you want a shorter string, you're going to see a faster swing, right? So they were able to kind of work through the problem and this stage characterized in their ability to rule out those competing possibilities. So they're like, no, this longer string wouldn't work, uh, especially wouldn't work with uh, a, you know, uh, any of these weights because of the the length of the string is going to be a long swing, right? But the shorter swing, right, would probably be with the shorter, the shorter string here, and it would be a lot faster, moving a lot faster in that way. So, you know, research suggests that, you know, not everyone reaches this stage as quickly, right? Only about 40 to 50% 40 to 60 percent of college students and adults fully reach it, the formal operational stage to be able to store a lot of ideas in your brain and and then rule out those competing possibilities uh, without having even to touch. Um, so you can look at it and then make decisions based on your experiences and look at okay, this is the physics of it, right? And see how how fast this might swing instead of having to again uh, try it out with trial and error. But again, here is the formal op operational stage. And, uh, again, I'll be posting these videos and, and listing them in the description. So here are some other ways to gauge um, the you know, formal operational stage, right? So it says these gauge um, your abstract and logical and your thinking abilities, uh, the two qualities that appear in early adolescence. It says, if you had a third eye, where would you put it? Okay. So it's, you know, just thinking about and, you know, just kind of a, 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 you know, an activity for yourself. Think about where, you, where you'd put your third eye, right? Like, well, many people would say, I'd put it on my forehead or I put it in, my, in the back of my head, right? So, and you'd have to describe why, 
Why would you do it? You know, where would you put it? Why would you put it there? Right. I would put it in the back because I'd be able to see in the front and in the back. Right. That might be, you know, a good option. Right. Some people were like, oh, well, I can't put it on my back because my hair would cover it. Right. But those are some options. Uh, the other question is, what would happen if people stopped having children? Right. And you can think about the other and think about abstract and being really logical. If people stop having children, then, you know, jobs that we uh, that there'd be uh, different jobs that we wouldn't need anymore. Right. So after a while, we would need preschools and we would need schools because and then we would eventually die off. Right. Uh, because there is no one, um, no one, you know, reproducing any children. Right. Uh, there might be. Um, after a while, you might see the, the world becoming a better place, right? Because we're not overpopulated anymore. Maybe the, uh, uh, the environment begins to improve. Global, global warming um, uh, is no longer an issue, right? Our resources uh, are shared a lot more uh, equitably and equally, right, among people, right? Maybe that's, maybe that's the part of what happens when people start having children. But those are thought processes that we go through. And these are questions that help to kind of gauge uh, your abstract thinking, like what, what, what do you think would happen, right? So think about those things, and uh, and that helps to kind of give you an idea of where you are. Okay, so when we evaluate Piaget's theory, um, there are three things that uh, researchers um, subsequent to Piaget have have discovered. Uh, Piaget appears to underestimate uh, a children's cognitive development. Right, there are a lot of things that children are able to do that Piaget kind of limited them in their, their ability to be able to do. Um, you know, children can and have some object permanence. They can, you know, think about, okay, if you put the, uh, the ball underneath the, you know, the, the, the blanket, right, they can still see the imprint of the ball. And so they'll still reach for uh, the blanket, right? And that happens even before, uh, before they hit, hit two years old. Um, so it's not just, um, him saying that these these uh, these stages are kind of limiting. Again, he did underestimate some of the cognitive ability uh, and development of children at that age. Um, there is a mixing of stages, right? So there's not a concrete uh, line that's drawn between the stages, right? And so this kind of hits at you know that uh, the blurred line and the continuous development and the overlapping of uh, some of the uh, the skills that are learned from one stage to the next. Right. So egocentrism, centration, all those things, they may overlap in certain stages. We might not get some. We may have some others that overlap as we move and develop. And there's kind of a mixing of stages and the transition between the stages is kind of gradual and not this abrupt end from, you know, the age of two and then from the age of two to the age of seven. Right. There is a gradual and a, a, a blurring of those lines. And then research also shows that. Uh, the sequence of the stages may be largely invariant. Um, PSA said that, you know, these stages were kind of universal and how children kind of pass through these stages, but they're not universal, right? PSA kind of underestimated the uh, influence of culture, you know, the factors that influence culture and cognitive development at, at certain ages in time, right? Uh, some cultures, uh, they play, uh, they, they put more emphasis on certain things than other cultures might, right? Um, and so it's important that we don't just overgeneralize some of these theories. We have to think about different cultures. And we talked about that, right? Um, when we talk about psychologists, psychologists need to be able to assign um, different cultures um, and research different cultures to see if these theories um, are and can apply to them um, instead of just looking at a, a very, very small sample size or a small group of individuals based on race, gender, or uh, a different ethnicity. So it's important that we evaluate each theory um, based on even cultural dynamics that might influence them. Okay. Um, Lev Vygotsky, um, his social cultural theory um, kind of hit uh, and uh, was a kind of an opponent to um, what we think of as Jean Piaget. And he talked about cognitive development that was really important with the social interactions. Uh, Jean Piaget, his theory was based on the individual child and how they developed in kind of an isolation with themselves and how they thought through the processes uh, in each of those four stages. But Lev Vygotsky looked at development and cognitive development in a social sense 
And he said that the social interactions with parents, teachers, uh, our peers, older older children uh, is more valuable uh, than just them developing on their own. It takes uh, the village around them, the environment around them to help them to develop cognitively. And he talked about language acquisition because of that social interaction. Uh, social interaction is extremely crucial in fostering cognitive development. And uh, we talked about um, being able to talk to other people is how we develop our uh, our language development in a, in a faster way. All right. Uh, he talked about level bias. He also talked about private speech and how we use private speech to talk to and through issues. And as toddlers, we kind of speak aloud when we're doing something, right? Um, we hear talk, toddlers talking to themselves all the time when they're playing by themselves. And then eventually that private speech then becomes internalized as they become non, more nonverbal dialogue uh, as they begin to develop, right? So people have uh, a dialogue with themselves. Initially, again, it's uh, out in the open, you know, when they're, you know, performing an action, they're talking through it. Um, but again, that private speech, um, the egocentric is kind of minimally relevant to cognitive development. Now, that private speech has nothing to do with it at all um, because we all go through internalized speech and talking through um, issues when we're um, when we're moving, moving through problems uh, that we experience in life. Okay. All right. So again, we talk about um, personality now. We talk about cognitive development. Um, now we have to talk about personality development. How do we uh, become who we are? All right. Um, personality development was very well put together by Sigmund Freud um, in the earlier part of of the 1900s, and he claimed that the basic foundation of who we are, our individual personality, is firmly laid down at the age of five. And research continues to be laid, studied, right, to uh, to refute that because um, research has shown that we continue to develop our personality, we begin we continue to grow um, our personality and develop our personality even beyond uh, childhood, even well into. Uh, adulthood and our, our personality does change um, as we have different lived experiences um, and, and move through the environment. Okay, um, but again, Eric Erickson is one of the theorists um, who built on Freud's work uh, and believe that early childhood does play uh, a really major role in personality development. But he also theorized that we do continue to evolve um, over the entire lifespan in specific stages, and we'll talk about those stages uh, in the next few slides. When we think about stages, um, just like the stages of development and the cognitive development, the pre-operational stage and sensory motor stage, these stages are those developmental periods. Uh, they have these characteristic patterns uh, of behavior that are exhibited and we can see them and uh, certain capacities become established. So when those developmental milestones are met, just like when we talked about, uh, you know, the motor skills, when those developmental stages are met, then you start to see a, a drastic change in behavior, and you can kind of uh, you can kind of observe them overtly, see the uh, the uh, behavior, and then be able to mark uh, that period as okay, you're moving into the next stage. Um, when we talk about personality, we'll we'll focus a little more on personality um, in chapter eleven. But you know, we have the five uh, personality traits, um, and these broad personality traits um, serve as kind of the building box to our personality. So you have uh, those five, you know, neuroticism, openness, conscientiousness, um, you have extroversion, um, and then you have those others that we'll talk about. But again, the big five are uh, those broad traits that serve as those building blocks for, for us. And um, we have to be really mindful of that. Those, those really, really basic uh, personality traits, um, because again, they do help to explain who we are and who we become um, as we evolve as people. And again, we talk about the big five. Um, again, big five is, you know, agreeableness, extroversion, openness, um, consciousness, conscientiousness, excuse me, and eroticism. And we'll focus a little bit more again, like, again on that uh, when we talk about uh, on chapter 11, when we talk about personality. Um, so Erickson's stage theory, uh, we're going to focus specifically uh, when we talk about 
uh, the beginning parts of us beginning uh, our development personality. We're going to focus on stages one to five. And then when we talk about the adulthood period, um, we'll look at six, seven, and eight as a, as a re kind of results uh, in our development. Uh, but again, six, seven, and eight, we'll talk about in part two of uh, this lecture. Okay? But each of the eight stages brings a uh, psychosocial crisis, right? Um, and it's kind of a transition in our kind of our important social relationships. And we'll talk about how as we're moving through our social relationships, um, we're making, we're kind of in a, in a crisis mode. Uh, and these crises are, they're not bad, right? Uh, when you're in crisis, that means you're, you're working through a, a period of growth, right? And you're making decisions based on um, uh, the optimal way that you want to grow. Uh, and the, the decisions you make will influence um, how you develop, how you grow and your personality in the long term. And your social uh, environment plays a big role in the decisions that you eventually will make. Uh, but the first stage is that first year of life. Um, you know, you're depending a lot on your uh, your caregiver uh, and other people are in your environment. And so you have to develop either a trust or a mistrust based on, you know, who's being supportive and who's not being supportive. We talked about, you know, our caregivers being really responsive and responding to the needs of their, their infant. And, you know, if they're able to do that and if they're doing that um, in a consistent way, you know, the infant then becomes a little more trusting, right? Uh, if there uh, is in some inconsistencies in the, in the support that they're getting in the world, then they'll be a little more mistrusting. And uh, and then the people that they experience outside of their immediate family, they're going to be a little more mistrusting uh, and may not view others as being really supportive of them. Okay. Uh, the second and the third year of life, uh, that is the autonomy versus shame. And uh, so, you know, at this point, you know, you're walking, you're talking, you're able to do things a little more independently. You're being able to dress yourself and feed yourself. And if you're being supported by your parent, right, if they're really supportive, if they're uh, really helpful and allowing you to do things on your own, um, then you will get a sense of, uh, you know, autonomy and feel a sense of, uh, you know, you know, self-confidence in yourself, even at two and three years old. Um, and so, but. If, you know, you're learning to potty train, and you're being supported in that. Um, but if you're being scolded and you're not getting enough support and, you know, uh, maybe your, your parents are really, really high and critical in what you're doing um, when you're, you know, feeding yourself and um, dressing yourself, then you might have a, a sense of shame and doubt, you know. Uh, so can I do things by myself or must I re always rely on others? And so if your parents aren't allowing you um, to to make decisions on your own uh, slowly, right? Just very, very small decisions, you know, during the second and third years of your life, then you might uh, develop that shame and doubt later on. Um, the third stage is, you know, happens through four through six years old, uh, the initiative versus guilt. Um, am I good enough or am I bad? And so during this time, you're making, um, making connections in school, preschool, and you're making uh, these very, very big decisions on, you know, when I'm making decisions and who I'm associating myself with, uh, taking initiative to, uh, to to study and to create friendships and all those different things. And again, your friends, uh, your support system is going to create, right? Are they supportive in, in my personality and who I am? Or are they not, right? Do I have guilt on and not being able to do certain things? Or am I able and, and have confidence in what I'm doing? Um, stage four is the industry versus the inferiority piece. Right? Am I competent enough to do things on my own? Right? And again, you talk about trust, autonomy, taking the initiative to do things, and then the industry versus inferiority. Am I and do I have the support um, to do things that I, I need to do? Have I been um, reared in a, in a really supportive way so that I have the competence in, in doing certain things? Or am I worthless? Do I, I feel like my parents have been really critical of me. They're not really all that supportive. Uh, they always have something negative to say of me or, you know, to me. Am I worthless? Right. And do I have any skills or talents that I that I possess? Right. So am I and do I exhibit any in industry? Right. Am I able to do things on my own versus 
uh, me being inferior, inferior uh, to other people in my, uh, my circle. Right. And the last piece is my identity versus uh, confusion. Like, who am I versus where am I? Um, you know, if I know who I am and I've been supported growing up, you know, I know I'm a good student. I know I uh, am really athletic. I know I am a good person. I know I'm respectful. I know I'm loved by my parents and my friends versus confusion where you've had a really, you know, dysfunctional upbringing. You know, you may not understand who you really are um, because um, you get a mixed signals from people around you. Um, so it's important that we develop a um, really consistent environment for our children um, so that they feel a sense of identity and are developing a sense of identity as they're growing up. Um, because with confusion, they start making decisions that aren't always the best ones. Because, uh, again, once you hit puberty, you're making you're going to be making some really important decisions. Right. Uh, and so it's important that they know who they are. If you know who you are, you know kind of what, you know, where you're being led to go, then you make better decisions uh, moving forward, especially uh, when there's stress, high stress situations. Right. Uh, more reasoning is that last piece uh, in development that is really, really important. More development is, you know, where we develop the distinction between right and wrong. And we engage in the reasoning between, you know, the two. Right. Are we doing things based on how we were raised or are we do we have a sense of self and how we develop our own sense of right and wrong? Right? And do, how do people develop their morality? Right. Do parental and social societal influences play a bigger role or and and or uh, do all kids develop morality in similar ways? And, you know, that's not that's not the case because we're all individuals. We don't all develop in the same way. And I believe a lot of who we are. And how we see right and wrong is really based on our parents, really based on societal influences. We learn a lot by observing, right? So observational learning plays a big role in this. Uh, and um, the conditioning, classic conditioning, operant conditioning that we go through, reinforcement and punishment that we receive as a young child, right? Um, you know, if we weren't ever reprimanded for stealing anything, then we're probably going to steal and feel it's okay to steal um, versus if we were reprimanded and disciplined because of for stealing, right? We knew that that was not right. Then we were less likely to steal and think twice about stealing if we ever reach or get into a dilemma where we have to think about stealing or not stealing for something. Okay. Um, so the Heinz dilemma is a uh, an, an exercise. It's a, a scenario that kind of checks to see where your moral development is and where you are in those stages. And we'll talk about uh, these different stages as we move forward. But here, here's an example. Um, it says, in this scenario, a woman has cancer and her doctors believe only one drug might save her. This drug had been discovered by a local pharmacist and he was able to make it for $200 per dose and sell it for 2000 per dose. It says the woman's husband, Hines, could only raise 1000 to buy the drug. He tried to negotiate with the pharmacist for a lower price or to be extended credit to pay for it over time. But the pharmacist refused to sell it for any less or to accept any partial payments. It says rebuffed, Hines instead broke into the pharmacy and stole the drug to save his wife. It says should the husband have done that? Why or why not? This scenario, um, if given to certain people at different stages in their life, they may have different answers, right? And so this scenario allows us to determine where we are in our moral reasoning and our moral development, right? At the ages of, you know, from one to about five or five or six, we're going to have a very different answer versus those who are uh, six to about 13. And then when we get into late adolescence and adulthood, we're going to experience and have different answers and our reasons for um, why he should have done it or not have done it is going to be different based on, um, again, the development of our moral reasoning. Okay, so Kohlberg used uh, dilemmas and scenarios just like that. He would present them to individuals in various stages, right, various ages, year old, like years of age, and again, based on his research, he was able to see that individuals answered the question very differently based on. Uh, the level and the stage they were in. Okay, so the pre-conventional stage, uh, this is where external authority, 
um, acts are wrong because they are punished or right because they lead to positive consequences, right? So during this time, you know, they have a punishment orientation, right? From about zero to, to three years old, they have a really big punishment orientation. And so anything that is, uh, you know, punished is wrong, right? Anything that is rewarded is right. And so they look at that and make those and draw those associations really, really easily uh, as young people. They have what we call a, na a naive reward system, right? Where again, acts are wrong if they're punished, acts are right if they're rewarded. And external authority is a big piece of this um, and, and how they are dishing out the rewards uh, and the punishment, right? That's a pre-conventional. So they might say it's not right because he shouldn't have stole it because he's gonna get, he's gonna get punished for it. Um, it's not right. Um, he should have he should have just let let his wife suffer through it. Right? The conventional level um, rules are necessary for maintaining social order. They internalize rules uh, to be virtuous and earn approval from others. Right. So during this stage, this is early adolescence and adulthood. Right. It's wrong because it's it's against the, it's, it's against the law. Right. Stealing is against the law. He should not have uh, stolen it because. There has to be some kind of maintain, maintenance in order here, right? But they internalize the virtuous and try to improve for the others, right? So when they answer the question based on, um, you know, they shouldn't have done it, they're wanting the approval, right? You're right about that, right? Um, they shouldn't have done it because that's against the law, okay? And then the last stage is the post-conventional stage or level. Uh, and it's sometimes this gets very rare, but you're working out your personal code of ethics. Uh, and many people may not comply with rules if they don't match or comply with their personal ethics. And so this happens when, you know, people are like, you know what? They needed that drug and it's OK if he if he stole because, again, his wife was dying uh, and they needed the drug. So he should have stole. He should have stole because it's really it's more important that we preserve life than the uh, the capitalism of selling a drug or pharmacist. I don't believe in, you know, pharmacology and pharmacists. And I feel like they're they're exploiting people by, you know, charging a, an extreme amount of money for drugs that um, take a fraction of the, the cost to, to make them, you know, so they should have stolen uh, that drug. And I don't think he should be punished um, for, for stealing, stealing the drug, right? But our individual principles and conscious of orientation, they play a big role in how we make decisions. And, you know, depending again on different scenarios so you sit down individuals it'd be various scenarios similar to the, the Heinz dilemma and he would look at how individuals uh, answered questions based on uh, those dilemmas. okay and here's just a, a visual representation so again Lawrence Kohlberg um, you know he, he explains youngsters develop a sense of right and wrong right but this development more reasoning happens in these different stages um, and it's not a seamless, uh, it's not seamless, right? People have and move through these stages uh, at different different age groups. Uh, again, there is, it's not invariable, right? Um, they do, we might think of right and wrong uh, in the conventional stage for a while and make a transition to the post-conventional stage. Um, and we might kind of remain in stage one and stage two for a while. And, and uh, so we, we, we don't move up all at the same pace. Um, really depending on our environment um, and how we're raised uh, kind of gives us um, the room to to move uh, through these stages and, and levels at different, different times and different uh, different stages of our life. Okay. Um, you know, here's another ethical dilemma. Um, you know, this is a movie, um, John Q, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite movies, because uh, it shows the dilemma that uh, that we go through. You know, his, his child needed surgery uh, and, and needed needed an organ transplant, right, to live. And uh, the insurance company would not pay for the procedure. Um, and so he was, he had to, in the last ditch effort, he wanted to save, right, his child. And so he held people hostage in the ER and he was forcing this doctor in gunpoint to, to perform the surgery, right? He was extremely desperate. And people in the movie theater, you know, you saw um, those who were a little, little older, like they were cheering because they were in support of him getting and saving his son. And eventually he was able to save his son, right? Um, he ended up going to jail, right? But he did it for his, his child's life and uh, to save his child's life. And, 
you know, that's that's part of, you know, the, the moral reasoning and ethical dilemma in life. Um, you know, our, our our moral compass is built based on um, how we grew up, you know, our social our social and our environment that we grew up in. And, you know, as we grow up, you know, the the right and wrong becomes something more than just right and wrong. It becomes is it and help is it helping people? Right. Are we helping people? Or are we not helping people? And uh, and so this uh, this movie kind of hits on that as we talk about uh, the dilemma and ethical dilemma and moral reasoning. Okay. So it says, in which level of Kohlberg's model does authority orientation occur where right and wrong is determined uh, by society's rules and laws, uh, which should be obeyed uh, rigidly? Um, and if you were paying attention again, there you saw that the pre-conventional. Um, then you got the conventional, you got the post-conventional. The chart gives you a good opportunity to see uh, that it is the uh, conventional level. Okay. All right. So again, this is what we've covered so far: um, prenatal development, motor, social, and language development. Um, then you have your personality, cognitive, and moral reasoning. Um, but again, all of these are really important as we move forward. We'll talk about um, a little further. Uh, we'll talk about. Um, um, adolescence, making the, the decision, you know, the, the physical, physiological changes that happen at adolescence. And then we'll talk as, and, and then the expanse into adulthood and then late adulthood um, in a lot of these different areas. Um, we talk about cognition, talk about personality development um, and uh, moral, moral reasoning as well.